I also want to thank the uh, committee that put together Science Week. You guys did a great job. I think we should give them a round of applause. Also, I'd like to thank my esteemed colleagues. This is going to be a really fun week seeing each other teach. In fact, I don't know that we ever get to see each other talk, so this is kind of a neat opportunity. Uh, what I selected to talk with you about was some research hot off the presses from uh, January of 2014 regarding the wild horse problem out west. Uh, have any of you ever met a Mustang? And I don't mean the car. Did you know they're out west? Okay, did you know that there's a problem? There better be some hands. Yeah, so my natural resource gets you. What uh, my specialty is, is dealing with environmental and natural resource issues. So what really trips my trigger is looking at issues that have an economic piece, a political piece, and a science piece. And so that's what I'm going to share with you today. Um, there is a serious problem out west right now, and it has to do with the uh, wild horses. Now, the, the big issue here is, do you think that wild horses are native to the United States? Show of hands. How many say wild horses are native, they're supposed to be here, they are a native indigenous species? How many call them an invasive species? Okay, what do you base your decision on? This is a rhetorical question. Do you base that decision on the fact that you heard that a few horses fell off a boat somewhere and ended up out west with Native Americans? Or are you basing it on any kind of scientific research? Rhetorical question. Are they native and is it relevant? You know, we have a huge uh, bent that occurred in the 70s where we decided we were going to start protecting animals and organisms. That is a very recent endeavor in, in humanity. And that only started in the 70s. And by the way, not everybody liked it. Okay, so that's a big issue is whether these animals should even be protected. Well, the law protects them. In fact, we have fossil evidence that suggests that these organisms were actually here. That these organisms were actually here. We have cultural evidence um, to that effect as well. There are two hypotheses that are being suggested right now. One is that these horses actually have been here with a continuous lineage and, and that they were just influenced by the influx of European animals. The second idea is the idea that they actually were wiped out with the glaciation and that they actually then repopulated. Some people actually think that Asians, uh, Asian horsemen came across. Um, that's one of the discussions and I would encourage you to read up on the papers I posted on our site if you want to read on that in terms of the fossil evidence. But what I found to be fascinating was the cultural pieces that they found. Uh, Claire Henderson, a researcher in Quebec, uh, talked with the Lakota or the um, Sioux and found out that their actual traditional peoples think that these aboriginal horses were here before pre-settlement. So that's what their family or their history, their word of mouth says. In fact, they actually have a word for their own horse. I have no idea how to pronounce it. I tried. I'm sorry. But uh, they had a word for their horse and they had a different word for European horses, which would lend you to indicate that there were two different animals, you might think. You might think that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the ecology of wild horses because it's very, very, very misunderstood. Um, they actually will improve the range if allowed to roam freely. The problem right now is that we are not allowing them to roam freely, and it is a problem, but it's a man made problem. Please allow me to elaborate. First of all, horses are uniquely designed to handle a semi arid. Um, they actually take coarse vegetation that ruminants find to be distasteful and they can convert that for us. They can convert that into uh, soil that will hold water. Now why would we want that in a semi-arid area? Why would we want a layer of, of this, this wonderful layer they can create with their poops? They can actually hold the water. Okay, so we want horse poop out there, let me tell you. And it does a much better job than any ruminant animal. Because when ruminants poop, they've already gone through several uh, digestive processes and the poop that comes out <coughs> while fertile isn't going to do the same thing with the soil building that horse poop will do. Now feces, okay? One of my favorite topics, feces. Uh, I, I happen to shovel a lot of this. Anybody here shovel horse feces? I don't mean to bag on ruminants, but I'm telling you, it's, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing when you're talking about soil building. Um, horses, what's cool about horse poop is that a lot of it isn't digested and it's got some really good stuff in it. And so when it lands on the ground, especially in, a, in an arid west, it will hold water, which is a precious commodity out there. In fact, that's a commodity that, that is so important for microbes and like the food chain. Okay, so we need that out there. And, and it's more valuable because also it's not totally digested. So it actually, there's seeds in it 
that can germinate. And the other thing is, the horses with their long legs and hooves can climb up into areas that your average bovine would never venture. And so they go up there and they deliver the poopage and they can actually improve the entire area. It's really great, okay? And then because they can cover, they, they eat a lot. So they can cover up to 100 miles and they can put that poop in all kinds of places. Cattle don't wanna go 100 miles either, not in three days. So the other thing they do with their powerful hooves is they can actually break open the ice for other animals. Paige Jackson, report to the main office, please. Paige Jackson, report to the main office, please. So there might be other animals in the area that can't break through, but the horse's powerful hoof can break through and open up the ice for other organisms. Um, they break the trail. Horses can break the trail. A horse is going to have a lot easier time breaking a trail than a small deer or another small animal, so they break trails and help out in deep snows. Also, they uh, like to wallow, so they can create actually natural ponds when they wallow with their giant bodies in there compared to the small things. In some areas, they can create riparian habitat in critical areas where maybe there's a drought, the horses, when they trash the place, are actually creating a riparian area. And also, they have this great way of being able to locate water. And if they can get at it and dig it up, they will. Again, freeing that up for the other organisms in the area. And that's why I call them team players. My favorite part of the BLM's argument about what they're doing to the wild horse is, well, there's no natural predators. Really, what happened to them? Oh my God, pumas, what happened to them? Wolves, what happened to them? Brown bears. Do you, you think a brown bear wouldn't take down a freshly born foal? I think it would. I think it would look at it as a yummy little scooby snack is what it would think. Okay, so we've actually targeted these species. We've targeted these species, which has caused a huge problem. Read all the Leopold's thinking like a mountain. When you go into an ecosystem and you remove all the top predators, you're just ringing the dinner Mr. bell. Mr. Rumpy to G2102. Mr. Rumpy to G102, please. You're just ringing the dinner bell for all these ungulates to take over and pretty much destroy and overgraze the entire area. We're seeing that happen here in our own state. We've got a huge problem. And it's open season right now on wolves. <coughs> open season. They are natural predators. Wolves are natural predators that will take down large animals, including horses. So in order to determine if these horses are native, you know, even if you don't believe me about the, the fossil evidence and the Native Americans, you know, maybe they were talking about something else, right? Okay, fine. Put all that aside. The two questions we have to ask is, where did the animal originate and has it co-evolved with its habitat? Where did it originate and has it co-evolved? Wild horses and their little friends, the burrow, are equids that are uniquely designed to survive out west. They have long limbs. They have sturdy hooves. Sturdy hooves. They're capable of traveling for water. They can cover miles and miles for water. Um, they travel several square days uh, during for grazing. They move all over the place, pooping on the way. Mind you, building soil for us, building soil and pooping along the way. Um, they prune plants versus ripping them out of the ground. Horses have teeth on the top and the bottom. So when they eat, they prune, okay? Uh, other animals, uh, ruminants, they don't have the double set. So they use their tongue and they use their top teeth and they actually rip the entire plant out of the ground. And the problem with that, we'll, we'll discuss in a few minutes, okay? Um, they, can reach, they can reach these remote areas. You know, we got a problem out west with fire. Well, if there were horses out there eating the brush, you wouldn't have as big of a problem with fire, would you, on a lot of those areas? Secondly, their hooves. If you've ever seen any Western, one of the hallmarks are the hammering of the hooves, whether they're coming in or going. And that, that land out there, because it's semi-arid, those hooves will just pound those seeds in, which can help with germination and keep them from being eaten by all the other little mice and things out there, okay? Um, but if you overcrowd horses, they're gonna destroy the area. If you overcrowd any livestock, they're gonna destroy the area. And the problem right now is we're overcrowding them. We're cramming them into small places. Okay, we're cramming them. This is a man-made problem, and we have to come up with a man-made solution. What we've done is we've taken and we've done high concentrations of desirable and undesirable, you decide which is which, animals. And, and now we have this problem. We've overgrazed the West. Everybody knows that. It's overgrazed. Okay. I will submit to you that when you look at the numbers, you're going to see that the ruminants are the ones who are causing the problem. The ruminants, 
The animals that we're putting out there are causing the problem. Not the wild animals, the ones that we're putting out there for money, okay? Which, do we need money? Yes. Do we need to eat? Yes. These are all factors, and that's why it's such a complex, juicy, fun thing to talk about, okay? Problem is, as I mentioned, these things rip the plants up by their roots, and they crowd the animals in, and then it exposes the area to wind and rain, which takes the soil down. <coughs> so instead of building the soil up, they're taking the soil down. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a, a, a systemic problem. And this is why the BLM says they're pulling our horses, our horses, yours and mine, this is our resource, pulling it off the range. They're pulling these animals off the range saying, oh, they're causing the problem. Well, I would submit to you that when you look at the numbers, the wild horses are, are not the problem. Okay, we've got one million cattle out there. Look on your paper. How many horses are wild right now? <coughs> How many wild horses are there? And you've got a million cattle. Not many horses and lots of cattle, okay? Uh, you've got big game interests. I don't want to diss any hunters in the house, but they're allowing huge, huge amounts of ungulates that, by the way, are starving to grow and populate so that they can charge big money. How much does it cost to go out and hunt out there? Anybody pay that number? Anybody pay to go out there and shoot a trophy? It's big money. Big money to go out there and shoot something. And why if I'm Wyoming? I want to have Abe and his family, all his uncles and brothers, come on out, drop a whole bunch of tourism money, shoot themselves their trophy, bring trophy home, mount trophy on wall, and then everybody else wants to do it too. Okay? So there's big money out there. Also, everybody wants to live out there now. So we're getting subdivisions, we got off-road vehicles, mining, energy development, and I mentioned the predation. This is a complex problem. It's not just the wild horses. Attention RTI committees, your meeting will begin in five minutes in room B105, the art room. RTI committee will be meeting in five minutes in room B105, the art room. So I want to talk about the land. Okay, back in 1971, when they finally decided to start protecting these horses, um, they set aside 53.5 million acres of land. That's a lot of land, okay? 27 million of it got zeroed out by the BLM and the U.S. Forest Service. Now, if you want to find an interesting read, go read about why they zeroed it out. It's a pretty interesting thing. Um, and it's too much for me to get into right now, but hopefully I'll wet your whistle on that to find out why, they, why that was changed. Um, so now we've got 26.5 million acres of HMAs, which are horse management areas. 26.5 million acres, and they only want to have how many horses loose on it? <coughs> Not many. So when we first started, there were 350 horse management areas. They whittled it down to 180. And what an AL, AML is, is the appropriate management level. And I've got that for you right here um, on this paper. If you take a look at Arizona, California, Colorado, you can see that they have an AML, which is the number that they've established. That's the number they've established. Okay. Um, so the BLM says that 150 animals per herd is the right amount. Equid specialists say you need 2,500 animals in order to have it genetically be sound and be a viable population. I mean, that's, that's a huge disparity in numbers. And so when you talk about science, do you go with the BLM, which is a government organization, or do you go with a specialist group? How do you decide which one's right? But that is, this is a problem. This is a problem. This isn't 20 different. This is a lot of horses. Okay? Now I want to talk a little bit about the food that's out there, okay? What we call them is Animal Unit Months, or AUMs. In 2005 fiscal year on the BLL, BLM land, uh, over 6 million, almost 7 million <coughs> units were consumed by livestock. And this is how much the horses ate. And on U.S. Forest Service land, 6.6 .6 million were consumed by livestock. And look how much the horses ate. Is this a wild horse problem? I mean, look at the numbers. Is it a wild horse problem that we have overgrazed lands? I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I'm just not. I, I'm seeing this is what I'm seeing, OK? And I know it's controversial. This is even more disturbing. Okay, uh, they, these guys have to pay. So the, the ranchers have to pay to use your land and my land. The ranchers have to pay. You know how much they have to pay? They have to pay 
the same number that was set in 1934 by the Taylor Grazing Act. It hasn't changed at all, okay? So it's $1.35 per AMU, which is 9 to 12% of the fair market value for that resource. So our government could be making what it's worth, but we're not. We're only charging 9 to 12%. I wonder why. There always has to be a reason why, right? Well, according to the 2005 report that I got my hands on, um, the government lost $123 million in order to prop up the public lands for livestock grazing. And real costs are actually estimated to be $1.5 billion if you take into account the ecological damage. Hmm. Okay, so we got less than 30,000 horses, we got over a million cattle. Why do you think the problem isn't being looked at in a different way here? Well, let's take a look. So just to put it in perspective, we're saying that we want, this is how many horses we're allowed to have. This is how many ranchers we have. So that's just a little over one in, in one horse per change for ranchers. That's how many Mustangs we should have out there, okay? Uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch, we're running a million cattle on these lands, and the top 10% of these guys own 65% of the livestock. So it's not ma and pa, with their cattle, it's huge corporations that aren't paying what they could be paying so that we could properly maintain these lands. I wonder why that might be happening. It might be something that you as a taxpayer might want to check into. And not, not to be undone, so we've got how many horses in holding right now? We have more horses in holding that are running around on the lands that have been designated for them. How much does that cost us? We're spending $46.2 million last year to feed these animals in a holding yard, is what we're doing. Okay? Annual cost to keep one Mustang in captivity. Miss Bottom, is that what you spend to keep your horses about? It's about what I spend. I spend $1,400 to keep horses in my place. I wonder why that's happening. Something to check out in these times of budget issues. Okay, so I, I basically have three questions that I have for you. Uh, number one, is this a good use of our resources? Number two, is this what's best for the land, the people, the horses? And number three, is this morally right? Now, the last question is for each of you as an American citizen to decide, right? I wanna take a look at these roundups because I want you to see what this actually looks like. shot by the guy whose research that I did. And the, the man that researched that I was reading, um, he's actually a range scientist. He's a biologist. It's a rhetorical question. Their agenda is they want this to stop. So I'm going to um, show you that I have some other videos for you. Um, I have videos of the holding facilities if you want to see how your tax dollars are being spent. And um, the videos that you see that the BLM puts out are a very, very different tenor. Um, it's really interesting. I want to show you just a short snippet of this just so you get the feel of like the polarity of the issue. Are, and it's just down home on the farm. Um, that's the message that this is this is the thing we're doing here. And I think I think big picture, what I would ask all of you to do as young men and women in our society is to think about this is not the only issue where science and thanks where science and economics and natural resources and hard decisions come together. There are a lot of ways to approach this. I mean, we could go out there and just shoot them all and end the problem. And, overgraze the whole place with cattle. We certainly aren't gonna all go vegan. How many of us in here are meat eaters? I am. There's no simple answer to this, but what I will ask you to do is to look at these numbers and take a look at this and say, does this really make sense and is this really the problem? And if it's not really the problem, why isn't the problem really being addressed? There's a lot of people out there. I wanna end with the, um, these horses are up for adoption. 
you know, if you want to try and help out, um, you could you could go and you could adopt a Mustang. Um, they're doing very well. Lots of people have had good success. This just opened today. And here are all these Mustangs that you can buy for $125. How much did they say it cost per horse to, to round them up? They pay a guy with a chopper 350 bucks, but you can buy one for 125. I find this math to be compelling. And I would encourage all of you in these times of tight budgets to consider how is our money being spent? Is it being spent in the best way? And is it the best way for the range? And for, for you have a tool here, you have a Mustang that will improve the range. And we're removing them and putting animals on it that are tearing the range down. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. Maybe it does. Um, so I would thank all of you guys for coming, and I would ask you all to really think about this issue. And if you know anyone who could adopt a Mustang, you might be able to save one from a slaughterhouse. So that would be really great. Thank you. Could you switch to today's meet? I would encourage you guys to share on today's meet if you have any ideas or feelings about this. If you want, you can go there and you can share your ideas. Or if you do any research that you want others to read about, you can post it there.